Thanks, Saskia, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So uh, we usually think of visual processing in the brain as an image analysis system in which visual information enters the brain via the retina and gets processed one stage at a time as it travels deeper into the brain from the retina to the LGN, from the LGN to primary visual cortex, V1, and then on to higher cortical areas. But there's a problem that the visual system must solve that seemingly has nothing to do with vision. That's, that's on purpose, that's fine. Uh, and uh, this problem is that when an animal makes a movement, that movement has an effect on uh, the animal's sensory systems. So the visual system must uh, distinguish between self-generated stimuli uh, and those that come from the outside world. And here's a video to illustrate this problem. Uh, this is a clip from the New York Times. It shows a video from a camera mounted on a hawk's head. As you can see, as the hawk moves its head, the visual scenery changes very quickly. Uh, but how does the hawk's visual system take these changes into account when actually processing the visual scene? Um, so specifically, this raises the question of how does the visual system know when you moved as opposed to when the world moved? Um, and in previous rodent studies, uh, movement-related signals have been observed in primary visual cortex of head-fixed mice that were, for the most part, either free to run or not run. These experiments were done in setups such as this one from Chris Neal's lab, where the researchers recorded V1 activity and running speed simultaneously. And the basic finding from this kind of work is that V1 cells modulate their firing rates when the animals run. Uh, and there's a lot of really good work out there on this topic, and head fixation is a really useful tool. Uh, but we wanted to see if and how V1 activity is modulated uh, in freely moving rodents. Uh, so we recorded movement and neuronal activity in V1 or freely behaving rats, not hawks, unfortunately. Uh, and we did these recordings uh, continuously, 24-7, uh, to capture the natural behavior of these animals in their home cage. We split our recordings into 12-hour uh, chunks in the dark to find uh, movement-related signals, and 12-hour chunks in the light to find combined movement and visual signals. We then further split these uh, recordings into two-hour sessions to just facilitate analysis. So we implant a 16 tetrader array into V1 in the right hemisphere, we also attach a nine-axis combined accelerometer, magnetometer, and gyroscope on the animal's head. Uh, and this essentially tells us the animal's yaw, roll, and pitch signals, which are its head direction in allocentric space in 3D. We also get its total acceleration, which is just the norm of its uh, linear acceleration along the three axes. And we'll use this as a proxy for the animal's overall movement. Our electrodes are uh, arranged uh, in V1 in the right hemisphere along the interior-posterior axis uh, in a two by eight grid, and resulting activity looks kind of like this. We have in red up top the four movement signals uh, or direction signals, and on the bottom uh, activity from one example tetrode. The physical setup looks like this. Uh, the rat hangs out in this 15 by 24 inch home cage. Uh, this is just an example video, but in the actual recordings, the plastic floor is replaced by bedding, and the animal has access to a food bowl, a water bowl, and a chew toy. So at first glance at the data, uh, we confirmed in freely moving rats what people have been seeing in head-fixed mice, that there's a modulation of activity in V1 in response to movement. So this is one example bout of a movement aligned to uh, spikes extracted uh, in this raw trace, uh, and uh, also extractive spikes in this uh, raster from our 16 tetrodes. Uh, so this is good, but we wanted to see if we want activity responded to specific movements. So we decided to look at orienting movements, or turns, which we uh, extracted from head direction data by taking derivatives uh, of each signal and finding peaks in the resulting velocity vectors. Uh, and here, X's mark the spots where turns were detected. So like this, we can get a hold of not just the left and right turns, but also clockwise and counterclockwise tilts of the head and up and down nods. And then we can align uh, this behavior to the neural activity like this. So when we do this, uh, for all of the turns, we can overlay them. Uh, and here we have velocity at the top with left and right turns on the left, uh, clockwise and counterclockwise in the middle, and up and down nods on the right. Uh, on the bottom two panels is the z-squared multi-unit firing rate extracted from 
84 two-hour sessions and five rats and averaged across all turns and all tetras. Um, and throughout the SOC, purple uh, traces are going to indicate uh, sessions in the dark, and green ones are going to indicate sessions in the light. And again, we can do this not just for right and left uh, turns, but also clockwise and counterclockwise uh, tilts and up and down nods. So uh, there's two things that I want you to note from, from this figure. Uh, the first is that in the dark, V1 appears to be suppressed uh, during these movements, these orienting movements, whereas in the light, it appears to be excited. Uh, and the second is that if you look at the time series, uh, there's the, each of them appears to be slightly different, suggesting that there might be information in V1 about the direction that the animal is turning. So we wanted to see if we could actually predict this turn direction from V1 data, especially in the dark, when V1 isn't uh, getting any actual visual flow information. So we decided to use a logistic regression model to uh, see if we could do this. So the logistic regression takes half of our sessions for fitting and the other half for testing. Uh, so this is a confusion matrix uh, for the model with the true turn directions on the y-axis and the predicted turns on the x-axis. Uh, as you can see, it performs pretty well. It can tell apart not just left from right turns, either in the light or, or the dark, but also clockwise from counterclockwise tilts, uh, up from down nods, and so on and so forth. And we think this is interesting partially because from most previous work due to the head fixation constraints, uh, that work focused on encoding of movements as a scalar variable, whereas in our data, I hope to convince you, uh, we can see that V1 encodes the details of movements in addition to the running speed. So uh, this led us to our next question, which is where does this information come from? Uh, does it actually uh, come from uh, motor areas, perhaps like secondary motor cortex, which has previously been implicated in visual flow prediction. Uh, so we decided to lesion uh, M2 excitotoxically using bilateral injections of ibotenic acid. This was work with, done with uh, Javier Macis and Stefan Wolf. Um, and so here's a micro CT scan of one of our lesion subjects. Uh, this is a digital coronal slice on the left and a digital uh, sagittal slice on the right. The green box highlights, uh, roughly speaking, the extent of the lesion. Uh, and despite the severity of these lesions, these animals actually still moved normally. Uh, so here are the numbers of extracted turns per session uh, in the four conditions. Um, which, so the satisfied is that the animals still actually behaved normally despite being lesioned. So we lesioned four rats like this and implanted them with tetrodes in V1 and put them back in our behavior box. Uh, here's what that, their data looks like. So they still make the same orienting movements, uh, but the underlying activity in V1 is greatly suppressed. Uh, and here's that same data overlaid with the data from the non-lesioned animals, uh, and those are the slightly darker lines. Uh, so the turn line V1 activity was reduced, but the question still remains, is there still information there about the turn directions? Uh, so we tested the lesion animal data using our same logistic regression model, and found that actually it does not predict turn direction well in the lesioned animals. Um, and uh, we think this is, uh, so as you, can, you can see it's guessing mostly uh, up and down in the dark, and we think that's partially because the actual activity in the lesioned animals looks most like the activity in the up and down case in the non-lesioned animals. So um, as far as we can tell, uh, V1 activity has categorical information about the movement direction. But we also wanted to see if you want to encode kind of more fine-grained information about the head direction. And I want to emphasize this because what I've been telling you about is orienting movements. But we also have information from our data about the direction that the rat's heads are pointing in. And typically, head direction cells have been found uh, in thalamic nuclei and limbic structures, such as uh, the interrhinal cortex, as well as in retrosplenial cortex, uh, which happens to provide one of the major synaptic inputs to V1. So is it possible that V1 activity might actually reflect head direction as well as the movement direction? Um, so head direction in 3D is encoded by our yaw, roll, and pitch signals. So we asked if we could use the V1 activity to decode head direction, especially in the dark when uh, the animals can't see and V1 is, isn't getting any visual cues. So we used a ridge regression uh, model to, uh, with inputs of V1 multi-unit firing rates. Uh, to predict uh, the head direction variables one at a time. And again, the model was fit with half of the data within a session and tested uh, on the other half. 
And here's an example of one session recorded in the dark. So this is the half of the data that the model was tested on that it hasn't seen before, with the true movement plotted in black and the predicted in red. And so as you can see, we can uh, get pretty good predictions, not just for the total acceleration, so how much the animal is moving, but also for the pitch, the roll, and the yaw signals as well, even though there are clear caveats with using a linear regression on a circular variable. We can still do pretty well, and we think this is just a lower bound of what can be done. Um, and again, this is one example session from, a, from the dark recordings, but this decoding works equally well in the light. So this is a, a summary of decoding across all our sessions, and this is very much highly above chance. Uh, so we then, we're still working on this, but our next question is, what actually happens on a neuron-by-neuron -neuron basis? Where does this uh, decoding ability come from? So we decided to look at some single units plotted as a function of the actual movement. So this, these are uh, firing rates of individual units. Each line is one unit. The black lines are putative fast spiking interneurons, and the red ones are the putative pyramidal cells. Um, and you can see that for, for a lot of these cells, there, there appears to be some tuning there to actual head direction. And this is, again, one example session from a dark recording. Um, and we can do this again for all the yaw, the roll, and the pitch as well. Uh, so in conclusion, our V1 activity is, uh, we can see that it's decreased during orienting movements in the dark. Um, it's increased during orienting movements in the light. Uh, it contains turn direction information that depends somehow on secondary motor cortex. Um, at the same time, V1 activity reflects the 3D head direction information as well, um, both in the dark and in the light. And the question that remains is, what does V1 actually use the head direction information uh, for? Um, and we think that they might serve as a corollary discharge signal or a predictive coding signal, but more work remains to be done. Uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, my lab, uh, especially uh, Javier Macis and Stefan Wolf, who helped with, uh, with some of the histology and, and viral chasing that I didn't have time to tell you about. Uh, Joel DiPello, who helped us with some uh, initial modeling. We initially used a very deep uh, convolutional neural network to do this head direction decoding, but found that uh, linear regression works just as well, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Harvard Center for Brain Science, the Neuroengineering Corps, which is super helpful uh, for, for getting things to work, uh, Ben Selvetsky and Rick Bourne, who are on my committee, the GRFP for funding the rats. Uh, it's a huge privilege to be able to do invasive experiments in animals, so it's not to be taken for granted. And thank you for listening. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. I might actually, while people come up, I might ask quickly, and I think you were kind of getting at this in your, uh, in your conclusions, but I mean, we know that the visual system even before the cortex has done a lot of work to try and subtract these visual cues of yep. motion out. So how do you, do you have ideas about how that's kind of interplaying with these motor signals that are coming back in? Right, right. Um, so so, so the people know that there's, there's kind of subtraction of these kind of things even in the retina. So the retina can tell global motion apart from, from you know, object motion. So um, it's possible that those kinds of things are more for stabilizing uh, perception, whereas this is for canceling out the effects of emotion when you need to uh, kind of do active movements. But I don't know. Could you go back to the uh, single cell preferences? Yeah. It seems like the preferences are most strongly in the inner neurons. Do you have an idea why that might be? Uh, no, and so we're, we're still going through all the data. This is just one, one example session. Uh, we, we, we started looking at like a orientation selectivity index, and it looks like there's not a whole lot of differences. It just uh, partially a way of plotting this is, you know, it looks like the, the red ones are a little squished. But um, I'm not sure exactly. So because if you want gets gets input from all these other uh, motor and, and navigation related signal areas, right? So it's possible that uh, the interneurons get a preferential input, but it's, I, don't, I don't think the anatomy is actually clear on that yet. Uh, just a quick question. When you, when you do that decode and you see the head direction information in V1, 
Are you looking at something more than an integration of optic flow signals? How are you, how are you thinking about that? Well, well so um, half of our data is actually done in, the, in like complete darkness. So the animals, and that's what this example is here. So uh, there shouldn't be any visual information to actually integrate in these cases. You're sure you're in total, it's absolute darkness. It's not, it's not zero photons, but, but we've gone in with, uh, with a PMT and, and light meters, and we were pretty confident that uh, the animals can't see. And, and the, the data from aligned to the actual orienting movement um, here, I think really suggests that there's a difference uh, there. Um, that you know the, the, it, the V1 is mostly suppressed in in what we're calling the dark. Yeah, I just asked because particularly working with the vestibular system, there's dark and there's dark, and yeah. dark makes a difference when it's really dark. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I haven't even touched on the vestibular signals, which are still present there, right? So so that's another source of these signals too. So I have a follow-up question for the single unit recordings. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to look at the um, responses under the light condition? Is the response completely reversed, like the interneuron got suppressed, or like the excited neuron got more response? Um, for for the head direction, we're we're still we're still going through that data. Um, these are these are twenty four seven recordings, so there's there's a lot to sift through. Um, but uh, at least for the for the orienting movements. Uh, Again, we, we see really different um, activity patterns in the light versus the dark. But I, but I can't answer that yet for the, for the head direction. Yeah. Thank you again, Gregory. Yep.